believe it. We just got married. Oh, is that what we just did? Stop it. I thought your mother was never gonna stop crying. I know, right? I knew she never liked you, but I didn't think she'd take it this hard. I'm kidding. It's my dad that hates you. And <laughs> you'll really believe anything I tell you. I do, that's kind of why I said I do to you. You're so sweet and you're all mine. We're married. Can you believe it? I know. Now we never have to say goodbye to each other at the end of the night. Or have to call you early in the morning to come pick me up. Let the honeymoon begin. Oh, I made this for our road trip. Well, isn't that sweet? Now the couple's just married, heading off to their honeymoon. We'll see how well they're doing a couple of months from now, won't we? That's what we'll see. Well, we are in the middle of a series called Mixtape. We're talking about relationships, and today we're going to talk about conflict. Let's just jump right into it. There was a middle-aged man, just went and bought himself a Mercedes convertible. He was having the time of his life driving down the highway. The convertible top was down. The breeze was blowing through what was left of the hair on top of his head. He was having a wonderful time going 80, 85, 90, 95 mile an hour. When in his rear view mirror, he saw a highway patrolman coming up behind behind him, lights flashing. He thought to himself, I can outrun this guy. And so he put the pedal to the metal. He going 110, 115, 120 mile an hour. Then he came to his sense. He saw, what in the world am I doing? I'm too old for this. So he pulled over and waited for the highway patrolman. Highway patrolman got out of his car, asked for his driver's license, his registration. He said, sir, I've got 30 minutes till my shift is over. And today is Friday the 13th. If you can give me a reason I've never heard before as to why you were speeding, I will let you off without a ticket. Without missing a beat, the middle-aged man said, last week my wife ran off with a highway patrolman and I thought you were bringing her back. <laughs> Officer said, have a nice day. <laughs> I got one more. There was a woman, she was walking down the shore of the beach, and something came up in the waves and looked like an Aladdin's lamp. So she walked over there, and she grabbed the lamp. She rubbed the lamp. Sure enough, a genie popped out of the lamp. She was shocked. She, she says, this one like the Aladdin's wish kind of thing where I get three wishes? Genie said, no. Due to downsizing and inflation, we're only going to give you one wish, so make it a good wish. Well, she whipped out a map immediately, and she said, I want these countries to start fighting against, stop fighting against each other. And she was pointing to the Middle East. Jeannie said, listen, ma'am, these countries have been fighting against each other for thousands and thousands and thousands of years. I'm good, but I'm not that good. Wish for something else. She said, well, I'm, I'm a single, and, and I'd like to meet the perfect guy. I'd like to find a guy who loves the Lord as God with all his heart, soul, mind, and strength. I want a guy who's patient. I want a guy who is kind. I want a guy who doesn't mind doing some household chores. He'll put my needs ahead of himself. I'll try to do the same thing for him. I'm looking for a guy who doesn't just sit on the couch and, and watch TV and pass gas and belch all day long. I'm looking for a guy who's more interested in what's going on in my life than what's going on on the TV. Someone who's more interested in me than they are on what's on their phone. I guess what I'm asking for is I'm looking for the perfect guy. Jeannie said, let me see that map of the Middle East again. <laughs> <laughs> Friend, we're going to have conflict in our married relationship. Things aren't always going to be good. There's going to be moments when you're going to feel the blood rush into your head, and you might turn into saying some things that you later on regret. So today we're going to talk about how to fight fair. Can we do conflict in a way that actually builds up the relationship rather than tears the relationship apart? Because let's be honest, a lot of people do conflict the wrong way. They accelerate. They throw poor accelerant onto the conflict. They, that's like kerosene onto a, a fire, right? That's what a lot of people do. Let me share with you some ways that people handle conflict in a poor way or what starts conflict uh, along the way. For, first thing is that we withdraw from the other person. 
Or we play the silent treatment with the other person. I don't know if you can tally these up as you go. You can tally them for yourself. And if your spouse isn't playing along, you can elbow them and tally them for them. All right? That'll help them a bunch right there. Withdraw the, the silent treatment. Someone said something. Someone did something. It hurt your little cub's spirit. And now you're upset. Rather than being mature enough to sit down and say, that really hurt me and this is why. And having a mature conversation, you just shut down. You don't want to be with them anymore. You don't want to talk to them anymore. You find yourself uh, paying more attention to somebody else in the room than you are to the spouse who has hurt you. you you're, not, you're not rude to them. You just give them real short answers like yes and, and, and no and, and maybe. But they're paying more attention to the kids and showing your children how much more you love them than you love that slob over there, right? That's how that works right there. Some of you guys, you go into the garage and you tinker around with your car, even though there's nothing wrong with your car, and you'll do that for hours at a time, just looking for some project. Just anything you can do to distance yourself, stay away from the other person. Then the other person comes up to you and says, hey, is there something wrong? Or is everything okay? And you say, oh, yeah, everything's fine. Is there any reason why it's not okay, you think? You, you think there's any reason anything going on between the two of us? I mean, you're kind of fishing for them to come up with what, you know, how they hurt you, how they wounded you, right? Hey, the silent treatment, withdrawal, that's an excellent way to kill your marriage. Then let me give you another one. It starts a lot of conflicts. You ready for this one? It's, it's un, uh, 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 unspoken expectations. When, when you don't speak your expectations of what you want the other person to do. A lot of ladies play this game. Sometimes guys play this game. Well, we don't just say what we want. We kind of do a little test, you know. We kind of go around about to find out if they're really in tune with us emotionally or not. Where they really catch on to what we're trying to say. Let, let me illustrate what I'm talking about. There's a couple. They're driving down the road. And they're going on a cross-country trip. They've been in a car for several hours. They come upon a sign that says, uh, Dairy Queen, next exit. Wife turns to the husband. She said, would you like to get some ice cream? He said, no. Not hungry for ice cream. And then he drove by the exit. <laughs> next 20 miles, there's silence in the vehicle from his wife. And he's thinking, what did I do now? I must have done something, but I don't know what that I did because I'm just sitting here driving, haven't done anything. So he turns to his wife. He says, is everything okay? You've been awful quiet for the last 20 miles. She said, I'm fine. He said, no, 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 no. I can sense that there's something not right. There's, I, I must have done something, but I can't come up with what it was because am I driving wrong? Is that what's going on? Am I going too fast? What's the matter? She said, you know. He said, I don't know. I, I'll be honest with you, I, I, I don't know. She said, 20 miles ago, I asked you to get me some ice cream, and you blew right by the exit. He said, oh, no, 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 no. You did not say that. You asked me if I wanted some ice cream. I said no, so I kept driving. She said, you knew what I meant. <laughs> no, he didn't. No, he didn't. Let me talk to all the ladies here for just a second, Okay. If I could share with you one key thing about how to eliminate a lot of conflict that you have in your married relationship, ladies, say what you mean and mean what you say, okay? Your husband's not that sharp. Do you understand what I'm saying? <laughs> he's dull. I'm telling you, he's not the brightest light in the sky. He's a few, a few fries short of a Happy Meal. You understand? The, the train lights are on. The big things come. There ain't no train coming through. You understand what I'm talking about? He's never going to figure it out. So all that is holy, for the love of God himself, speaking on behalf of every man on the face of the earth, say what you mean, mean what you say. There's a guy like, I'm not clapping. I'm telling you that right now. <laughs> He's not right, honey. Yes, he is. He is right, I tell you what. That was very brave of you to applaud that, I tell you what. A lot of guys sleeping alone tonight, I can tell you that right now. That's what's going to happen. But we have these un 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 unmet expectations. Why? You have this idea of what you think, they and you think, well, if they're in tune with me emotionally, they're going to catch on. I'm just going to tell you right now, they're not going to. If it's the guy playing this game, it's the girl playing this game, it's just not. It's going to mess your relationship up. Let, let, let me give you another one, threatening the other person. Threaten them. So you, you do that again. You see what happens. You threaten to walk out. You, you, you threaten divorce. Some people even threaten physical violence. 
If that's happened to you, you get to a safe place. You get out of that situation as quickly as you possibly can. Other people, you know what they do? They just throw in the towel. You say, well, they get divorced. No, I'm not talking about getting divorced. They just live in misery. They just throw in the towel. They say, no, forget about it. I don't even care anymore. I don't care anymore. Whatever. That's the mantra. Whatever. Whatever you want to do, you're going to do it anyway. You just go ahead and do what you want to do. You do you, I'll do me. The Bible says when two come together in in holy matrimony that the two become one, where you can't tell where one ends and the other begins. When you start living your life as if you do what you want to do and I'll do what I want to do, you've separated that oneness and you've become roommates. You're just two people, you know, under living on the same roof of a house. You're you're the two people that are just paying the bills. You're just kind of coexisting with each other. But there's no oneness. There's no intimacy in that married relationship. If you're doing any of these things, you've got to stop the insanity Not only are you destroying your marriage one bad fight after the other, but you're a terrible example to your kids. Your kids believe that you are Christians. And that should mean something to you, that the way you respond to each other should be with gentleness. It should be with respect, right? Don't let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouth, but only what is helpful to benefit those who are listening. That's what the Bible tells us to do in in Ephesians. And so our kids watch this, and and they grow up with insecurity because mom and dad are constantly fighting. So we're wounding our kids as well. So if you say, I'm ready to stop the insanity, well, today is for you. Because I'm going to give you a new way of conflict, a new way of relating to each other to where you can have a disagreement and you can actually leave the disagreement feeling better about each other than you did before. Wouldn't that be something? We're going to look at a passage of scripture in 2 Samuel chapter 6. David has a massive fight with his wife and they do everything wrong. So we're going to learn from a bad example all the things that we should do. Now, let me set this passage of Scripture up. David is married to a woman by the name of Michael. She is the daughter of King Saul. Obviously, he wanted a son. He said, we're going to name her Michael anyway. That's what's going to happen. So that's what we've got. we got David and his wife, Michael. Now, here's, here's what's taking place. David has now become the king over Israel. One of his first acts of duty is to get the Ark of the Covenant back to Jerusalem. This is a big deal. It's been years since the Ark of the Covenant has been in Jerusalem. This is the throne of God. This represents the very presence of God. And David is so excited. And they've they got a little parade going down the streets. They're carrying the Ark of the Covenant. Priests are carrying the Ark of the Covenant. And David is before the Ark of the Covenant. And he's laughing. And he's dancing. And he's singing. And he's worshiping the Lord. And he gets so caught up in the moment that he starts throwing his clothes off. Don't get that caught up in this place, okay? Just don't do that, all right? We appreciate that an awful lot. He's throwing his clothes off here, over here, over there. And all he's down to is his ephod. You say, what in the world is an ephod? Well, it would be the equivalent of a kilt or bicycle shorts or underwear. That's what he's got. He's dancing around the streets in his underwear. And the Bible says that his wife, Michael, looked out from the window, saw him acting this way, and she despised him for what he had done. Now, David thinks he's going to come home a few hours later. His wife's going to be excited. She's going to celebrate with him. This is a big deal. The Ark of the Covenant has come to Jerusalem. He thinks he's going to have the greatest welcoming that any husband has ever had. But that's not what she does. Let's take a look at it. Michael says how the king of Israel has distinguished himself today. This robing in the sight of the slave girls of his servants as any vulgar fellow would. David said, it was before the Lord who chose me rather than your father or anyone from his house when he appointed me ruler over the Lord's people Israel. I will celebrate before the Lord. I will become even more undignified than this and I will be humiliated in my own eyes. But by these slave girls you spoke of, I will be held in honor. Can you see it? He comes home thinking he's going to be greeted. Thinking he's going to be congratulated. And she's waiting for him. Oh, how you danced in the streets as any vulgar person would. She attacks him verbally. Let me ask you a question. When you're attacked verbally by your spouse, what's your go-to? Some, we withdraw. But most, we give it right back. 
And that's what David did. He said, oh, oh uh, who's king? I'm king. Oh, your dad? I remember your dad? He was rejected by God. And for your information, I'll dance any way I want to. In anything that I want to dance in. I will dance before the Lord. I will become even more undignified than this. It's none of your business. Can you feel the heat? Can you feel the anger and the conflict that's ensuing? Now, some of you ladies are sitting here going, hey, man, Michael has a point. And I agree. If your husband's out in the street dancing in his underoos, that's an issue, okay? <laughs> I mean, you might, well, might want to address that as soon as possible. But it might not be the right time under the greatest victory of his life. You see, there's a right time to say the right thing in the right way, and there's a wrong time to say the right thing in the wrong place. And, and, and that is what has happened here. I, I wonder how that couple's doing, the one that just got married and drove off into the sunset. Months have now gone by. I wonder how they're doing with conflict in their marriage. Well, let's take a look and find out. Take a look. Hey, babe. Do you think you can try to put the toothpaste cap back on after you're done using it? Sure. I mean, I don't see what the big deal is. Going to open it again tomorrow anyway. Just do it, please. Fine. It's not like I nag you for all the little things you do, like not replacing the toilet paper correctly. There is no wrong way to replace toilet paper. Uh, yes, there is. If you put the toilet paper face in the wall and you reach to get more and you've already wiped, then... I, you just wouldn't understand the science of it all. Oh, so you think I'm stupid? That's not what I'm saying. Is I'm... my brain not capable of handling your mind-blowing butt-wiping ways? Here we go. You know, at least I'm smart enough to put the toilet seat down after I'm done using it, even though you think I wipe like an ape. Well, at least me leaving the toilet seat up never hurt anybody, like when you leave your hair dryer out. My hair dryer has never hurt anyone. So me tripping on the hair dryer cord and bumping my head on this counter was all a part of my imagination? Well, it couldn't have been as bad as the time I tripped on the towels that you left on the floor. My face hit the wall, Colin. Yeah, you really need to clean that one up. It was your towel. You should clean it up. Uh, no. I already clean up enough of the messes you leave. Oh, like what? Like the hairballs I pull out of the drain all the time. smell still keeps me awake at night. Oh, so you think my hair smells? That's not what I'm saying. You know what? I can't even with you right now. Nice. Just walk away. Stupid towels. Now, there might have been something in that video that might have confused you a little bit, so let me clear up the confusion for you. The toilet paper goes over the top. <laughs> over the top. Or you just stuck there spinning all day long. You understand what I'm saying? And that's not a, over the top is how it goes. All right, so let's, let's talk about conflict. Let's come up with a brand new way of doing conflict that is better than the way that we've been doing it. You ready for this? Rule number one of, this, of great marriage is this. Be nice. Be nice. You wouldn't think I'd have to say that, but be nice. Stop being rude. Stop being cynical. Stop being sarcastic. Stop slamming the other person. Stop making the other person think that they're stupid. Stop trying to win. You've got to get that out of your mind. The two become one. I've, I've told you this before, and I'm going to keep saying it. If one of you is trying to win the fight, you've lost. Because if your spouse walks away from that argument feeling like they lost, well, the two were one, and now you've just ripped apart the oneness. You've lost in that situation. It's not about winning and losing. It's about reconciling. It's coming together. Do we have to be mean? Do we, do we have to curse? Do we have to use profanity? Do we have to yell at the other person? Let me, let me ask you a question. If I came to your house and I spoke to your spouse the way you speak to your spouse... Would you be okay with that? If I came to your house and I used the same tone, I, I used the same verbiage, I used the same exact words, and I yelled at them and I screamed at them and I shouted profanities at them, would you let me get away with that? You'd say, no, you can get out of my house right now. 
Some of you guys, you'd punch me in the face, and I deserve it. I don't have any right to talk to your spouse that way. What gives you the right? Have you forgotten who you're married to? Your wife, your husband is a child of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. They are a prince. They are a princess. You dating somebody? Who do you think you're dating? You're dating the child of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. You're supposed to leave them in better shape than the way that you found them. You're supposed to lift them up. You're supposed to build them up. But we use sarcasm. We use ridicule. We say things under our breath. We, we treat the other person with disdain. We're not quick to listen and slow to speak and slow to become angry. We're the direct opposite of those things. And we just let loose and we wound the other person. And we wonder why we're not so close to each other anymore. It's because you're not nice. You treat people, some of us treat people that we don't even know, complete strangers, better than we treat the people that we say we love the most on the face of this earth. That's crazy, isn't it? There was, there was a gentleman and his wife, they were celebrating their 50th wedding anniversary. They were having the reception after the little ceremony that they had. And uh, there was a young man who had been married just for a few years, and he walked over to the elderly man who had been married for 50 years, and he pulled him aside, and he said, Listen, my, my wife and I, we've been married about four or five years, and we're going through a rough patch right now. And I want to know, what's the secret sauce? What's the special ingredient to having a great married relationship? And the first thing that the man said was, he said, you know, my wife and I, Sarah, we, we keep Jesus at the center. And he said, that's more than just a phrase. It, it's what we do. We read the Bible together. We pray together. We talk about spiritual things together. We go to church together. We serve God together. We're trying to hit the highest level of spiritual intimacy that we can have in our married relationship. And we've sought that for 50 years. He said, I, I still remember meeting her for the first time when, when we were in high school, and I just fell in love with her almost at first sight. After a few weeks, I knew that she was the girl for me. And a few months after we graduated, I asked her to marry me, and she said yes. She says, that's one of the secrets of having a great relationship. Keep Christ the very center. He said, oh, yeah, I, I can give you one more thing that I did. And the young man said, well, what else did you do? He said, on the day of my wedding... Sarah's dad came in to where I was getting ready, and I was nervous, and he handed me a gift. So I opened up the gift, and I went inside the box, and I pulled out a watch. He said, I've worn this watch for the last 50 years. It's been in the shop a few times, but I always have kept this watch on, and this watch has helped me an awful lot. The young man said, well, how in the world can a watch help you in your relationship with your wife? It was then that the elderly man showed him the face of the watch. For engraved on the face of the watch, the dad had put, say something nice to Sarah. He said, for the last 50 years, every time I've checked the time, every time I've checked the day, and I've been with my wife, I've said something nice to her. That, that, that story got me thinking, what, what if we did the same thing? Then I thought, well, what could we do to, to, to do that? What, what do we use a lot every day? Well, most of us, we use a smartphone every single day. And you probably pick that thing up, I don't know, a thousand times a day. What if you changed your screensaver from a picture to maybe a caption that said, say something nice, and then you put your wife or your husband's name. And every time you picked up that phone, it was a reminder. Before you got into whatever you were going to do on your phone, it was a reminder to look at your spouse and, and say something that built them up. Say something that encourage them. Can, can you imagine how that would change every aspect of your married relationship? Two people, every time they touch their phone, complimenting, encouraging the other person. That's the kind of marriage that all of us want to have. But, but I wonder how many of us will take it serious enough just to even change the screensaver to say something nice to your spouse. So what's the first rule when it comes to conflict? Be nice. Do you have to raise your voice? Do you have to scream? Do you have to shout? No, you can be nice to each other. Let me give you the second rule. If nice isn't on your mind, then put God on your mind. Because <laughs> I know how this is. Sometimes nice isn't on my mind. Christy's done something, or I've done something. She's upset with me. I'm upset with her, and I feel attacked. She feels attacked, and so we go at it back and forth, and we say all kinds of terrible things. Why, why in the world are we doing that? We should just take a time out. What if you just took a time out? Say, wait a second, I'm upset, you're upset. This is not the time for us to discuss this. Our emotions are too raw right now. We're going to hurt each other. 
Time out. You go spend some time with the Lord. I'll go spend some time with the Lord. He'll give us his perspective. He'll calm us down. Hey, I tell you what, tonight at 5 o'clock, we can have the fight then. Okay? But not right now in this moment. Let's get ourselves calmed down or we're going to end up attacking each other rather than attacking the problem. Don't you find it interesting that we call ourselves Christians and yet we never ask the Holy Spirit to help us when it comes to conflict? That we do the direct opposite of what the Bible says because we won't slow down long enough to say, hey, Holy Spirit, you take over my mouth. You take over this emotion. You, you calm me down in this moment. Here we call ourselves spiritual people and we just launch right into these conversations. It's the same thing for David. What was David known as? He was known after a man after God's own heart. Do you know how many times the Bible mentions that David and Michael got together and prayed? How many times David and Michael went down to the tabernacle to worship the Lord? Do you know how many times the scripture mentions that? Zero. Well, what in the world happened here, David? Why didn't you, why didn't you bring... God into the center of your married relationship. He never did. Did you? Because this past week your homework assignment was to what? Was to pray with your bride and then vice versa every night this last week. Some of you did it. Some of you didn't. And right now we're having what we call an awkward moment, aren't we? <laughs> At what point in time do you finally place Jesus as the foundation of your home? At what time do you finally say, I'm not just a Christian in word only, but I'm a Christian in action in how I treat my spouse as well? Why aren't we leaning upon God? Why aren't we seeking his face? Why are we just launching into these terrible things that we do to the people we say we love the most? Why aren't we more spiritual people? Hey, be nice. And if you can't be nice, get along with the Lord until you can be nice. Well, they didn't do that. Let me give you the third thing. Let go of all stubbornness, pride, and be selfless. Let me tell you, David and Michael wanted to be right. And they wanted to make a point. And, and so they launched into this mean diatribe towards each other. And it just made them feel more and more distant, more and more apart. It didn't bring the two of them closer together. It ripped that intimacy apart. Now, I'm going to share with you something. That if, if you try this out, I think it will work for you. It's worked for Christy and I when we've done it. Sometimes we didn't. and It didn't work out at all because we didn't do it. But when we do it, when we're in our right minds, it, it helps an, an awful lot. I teach every one of the premarital classes when we do this. I teach this little aspect of it so they would understand how to have a fair fight. So you, you can try this. You can keep doing what you've been doing if that works for you. If it's not working, maybe you want to try something different, okay? First thing is this. You, you sit down and you define the uh, problem that you're having or the area of disagreement between the two of you. And you get as specific as you possibly can about the area that, that's bugging you. Don't, don't speak in generalities. Too many times we speak in generalities. Just get as specific as possible. Now, this will stop the other person from bringing something else up that doesn't even relate to this one. Because that's what happens sometimes because we're still thinking win-lose. When we start to lose, we come up with some other issue that we think we can win in. This stops that. You would say, oh, no, 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 no. We're not talking about that. We're talking about this. We're trying to get a solution to this. Okay? So that's, that's the first thing you do. Second thing is this. Look at how both of you contribute to the problem. It's just rare, isn't it, for someone to be 100% wrong and the other person to be 100% right? Most of the time, both people are at fault a little bit. 90, 10, 80, 20, 70, 30, 60, 40, 50, 50. Here's where you just own your stuff. So here's the issue. How have each of you contributed to the issue? So the, the husband says, you know, I, I did this. I said this. And I, and I should, I'm sorry. Will you forgive me? And then the wife says, well, I did this, and I said this. I'm sorry, will you forgive? What's going on here? We're, we're lowering our defenses, aren't we? And now we're getting the emotion down. We're owning our stuff. And now we're putting ourselves in a position to be open to a brand new solution, right? And when you apologize, don't say things like, well, the reason I did what I did is because you did what you did. That's not an apology. That's shifting the blame on somebody else. 
So the second thing you do is everybody talks about how they uh, uh, add to the problem. Then you list all past attempts that have been made to solve the problem that didn't work. Because insanity is doing the same thing over and over again. And I bet you fought over the same thing more than one time. And here's the reason you fought over the same thing more than one time. Because you end the fight by saying, I'll do better. And she's like, okay, good. That's all I wanted to hear. You'll do better. And he's walking away going, I don't have a clue how I'm going to do better. But that got her off my back, and so that worked, right? And two weeks from now, what's going to happen? You're going to be in the same mess you were in before. So list all past steps. Now you're going to brainstorm some new ideas. Let's brainstorm some new solutions, and then let's pick a solution. Let's pick one trial solution that we're going to go after. Go ahead and go to the next slide. There, agree on one trial solution that we're going to try, okay? And then write down how each of you is going to do that particular part of the solution. So this is what the husband's going to do. This is what the wife is going to do. And then you schedule a meeting a week later to see if you did what you said you would do. This is called accountability. Did you do the things that you said you would do so you would end up with a different result? And if you did, if both of you did what you said you would do, that's a moment for celebration. You should go out to eat, come home, have a boom chicka wah wah. That's what you should do, right? What, and we celebrate. We're getting better. We're communicating better. We're dealing with conflict better. We feel closer to each other. And that is now an issue that's no longer an issue anymore. You don't threaten the other person. You don't use sarcasm. You don't yell at the other person. Do you remember when you were a kid and your dad would say something like, I don't want to hear another peep out of you. Didn't you want to go peep? I mean, didn't you? I mean, you really did, didn't you? Peep. I did that one time. I don't remember the next week, to be honest with you. I was knocked unconscious. I was in the hospital for a long, long time. That was back when you could hit your kid. You know what I'm saying? Why do we hate that so much? Somebody said, I don't want to hear another peep out of you because it's condescending. But don't, don't treat somebody else that way. Look what Jesus said here. He said, do to others as you would have them do to you. You want someone to treat you with dignity and respect? You want someone to be kind and gentle to you? Then you do that for others. Whether they do that in return or not, you treat others the way that you would like to be treated. And the last thing is this, rule number four, forgive quickly. Marriage is hard. Two selfish, self-absorbed, stubborn people trying to be less stubborn and selfish and self-absorbed. There's, there's going to be conflict, and you're going to hurt each other. You're going to hurt each other intentionally, unintentionally. The, the question is, is, what are you going to do with all that pain? What are you going to do with all that hurt? Colossians 3.13 says, be gentle and ready to forgive. I like that, ready to forgive. Forgive as the Lord has forgiven you. So here's your options. You can spend your time berating your spouse, distancing yourself from your spouse, holding what they've done over their head. Or you can take the same love and grace and forgiveness that God has shown you and you can extend that onto the person that you say you love the most on the face of this earth. You, you get to choose. And forgive faster. Don't wait a day or two or three. Forgive. Forgive as you've been forgiven. And, and how have you been forgiven? Well, God's forgiveness is completely selfless, isn't it? I mean, make no mistake, God was offended by our sin, wasn't he? But in the most selfless act in human history, Jesus laid down his life for us. And what did he say from the cross? He said, Father, forgive them, for they have no idea what they're doing. When you forgive somebody, it's a selfless act. That's why it's so difficult to do. Let me tell you something else. God's forgiveness is unlimited. No limit. To his forgiveness. There's no sin so great that he won't forgive that sin. He forgave Noah of his drunkenness, Moses of murder, David of adultery. He forgave Peter three times for denying him three times. How about this? His forgiveness is repeated. He doesn't forgive once or twice and say, well, you've hit the limit. Do you remember when Peter came to Jesus and said, how many times should I forgive my brother? Up to seven times? And Jesus said, 70 times seven. Some of you are doing math, 490 times, that's it. But after 490, that's it. That's 491. <laughs> no, that's not what he's talking about. He's saying an unlimited amount of times. Aren't you glad that God's never come to you and said, you did it again? Well, that's 491. I'm holding on to that one. And I'm going to hang that over your head to the day you die. Aren't you glad God doesn't treat you that way? The Bible says, though your sins be as scarlet, he will wash them as white as snow. 
His forgiveness is also unfair, isn't it? Nothing fair about the cross. The guilty goes free. The innocent pays the price. But it's a price worth paying. Because if you don't pay the price and forgive, you'll just be ate up with bitterness and resentment. And then one day your spouse will walk into the room and you'll despise them. And that's when your marriage is over. When you get to the point of despising their very presence before you all because you've held on to all of this hurt for so long. Look what the Bible says here in Luke chapter 17. It says, if your brother sins, rebuke him. And if he repents, forgive him. If he sins against you seven times in a day and seven times comes back to you and says, I repent, forgive him. David and Michael never forgave each other. And that was the beginning of the end. A few chapters later, David finds himself walking on his balcony overlooking his city that he's built. He sees a woman bathing calls for her. He sleeps with her. Her name is Bathsheba. He has an affair on Michael. That was the last nail in the coffin, but the grave had already been dug, all because they refused to forgive. So what do you want to do? Keep doing what you've been doing? Or how about we be nice? How how about we get along with God? We call a timeout. We Seek God, calm ourselves down. What what if we let go of the stubbornness and the pride and the need to win every argument? And what if we forgave and never brought it up ever again? We forgave in the same way we've been forgiven. That's a picture of a great married relationship. That's a mature married relationship. Don't let your emotions get the best of you. Let the Spirit of God get the best of you. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, help us not to make the same mistakes that David and Michael made. Help us, Lord. So many marriages right now, relationships right now, so wounded from just terrible ways of interacting with each other. And we carry around these scars and this baggage with us everywhere we go, and it just weighs us down. God, I pray that we would lay it down at the foot of your cross and that you would help us to throw those sins as far as the east is from the west, that we would forgive in the same way we've been forgiven. Lord, when there's not a nice thing on our mouth to say, may you set a guard over our mouth that we may not sin against you or sin against somebody else. Oh, God, may the words of our mouth and the meditation of our heart be pleasing in your sight. Oh, my Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Help us, Lord, to change. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.